Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon, you're watching Israeli News Live, and before we get into our broadcast this evening, which is a very interesting broadcast, just wanted to remind you guys, we are headed to Jerusalem. We will be there this week. Very interesting event, no doubt, the interfaith ecumenical movement that's going on, the house, uh, uh, this, as they call it here on the article here, a house for all believers opening in Jerusalem. It will actually open before I'm able to get there, but we will be there to cover that. And we just wanted to remind you, don't forget us. Be sure to continue to support. We've covered a great bit of things thus far, but we'll still need your continued help to make this trip possible. You can go to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. If you do do that by check, just remember it's the Noon Institute. And you can mail that. That'll be at the end of the broadcast. You'll see our address. Shalom and God bless. Sheriff Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Ukraine Crisis Media Center reporting a very interesting article today. Uh, yes, we do look at both sides of the conflict here, guys. I, like I said before, I just hate the media bias when I'm looking at these things here. Uh, but this particular uh, man right here, he happens to be a high-ranking officer, a Colonel uh, uh, Linsinko. Uh, this man right here for the Ukraine government reported military use of no heavy weapons for the first time in several months. The armistice is holding in Luhansk sector while militants use only small arms and mortar launchers in the Maripol Donetsk sectors. Militants conduct aerial reconnaissance. Russia continues supplying ammunition, fuel, and weapons, according to this here. Kiev, September the 2nd, 2016. Yesterday, for the first time, it states, in several months, militants did not fire a single time from heavy weapons. Ukrainian armed forces incurred no lethal casualties. One serviceman was wounded in action, said Colonel uh, Amidri uh, Linsinko. Spokesman of the Presidential Administration of Ukraine, ATO, related issues at a press briefing in Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Nevertheless, he added Russian Occupational Troops Command issued a permit to use artillery during the hours of darkness. You know, I, I thought that was interesting because I actually come across this article here right after I had seen uh, one of the frontline videos that was released uh, on the Russian Insider uh, news front is actually who made the documentary footage this was filmed in July of uh, 2016 here the same time we were reporting July the 8th of Ukraine moving tanks to the contact line with uh, Donetsk of course the OSCE could not get into that area they were not permitted that was noted in the report that I had found on the video footage but as this plays, and let me make sure the volume's not too loud, it is a battle uh, going on for sure. Well, we need a little bit of volume because I need you to be able to hear what's happening here. Um, these guys here, this, uh, it, of course, it is a documentary. They put it together for uh, the people to be able to see what's going on. They brought a cameraman out there to film on the front lines. And I'm going to get you a little bit more volume here. And right now, these are the separatists there. As you can see, as I've said before, a religious war. That were, those were saints and things on their, on their trees there. That's the Russian Orthodox Church uh, there. These guys are religious. But anyway, they're trying to call to get permission to engage the enemy because they're being shot at by Ukraine. And... It is loud too, and I don't even have the volume up very loud. There, right now it's a lot of small arms fire, but uh, it's fixing to be, in just a moment here, it's fixing to be mortars uh, start going off, and they're going off all around them. In fact, about four mortars go off. It takes them um, a good bit of time before they finally get an approval from whoever their commander is to be able to engage uh, the enemy that is striking them, which is Kiev, Poroshenko's forces. And you don't see this, guys. This is the part that we don't see. Now, some might suggest that this is a, 
you know, that they staged it. They intentionally didn't fire back this time or they didn't start the confrontation and make themselves look good for the documentary. Uh, but they're, they're continually asking for support on their radio. They're having a little bit of trouble with the connection as it goes on. We get nine minutes into the, into the video, and I'm going to go ahead and forward it up for you. They're still going, this guy right here is going to make a comment about that uh, because now they have gotten permission to launch. And so he's fixing, they're, they're getting ready to launch as soon as they get the go-ahead to begin to use uh, grenade launchers and, and things of that sort there. And they've, now they have gotten the permission to fire back. So now they're returning small arms fire back against the pro-Kiev forces. Um, and then, let's see, let's get us right on up there. Here he is right there. I can see it coming now. Nine minutes and six seconds here. He says he's got, he asked him to be quiet. I got a connection. So he's getting the approval to use more than just small arms fire now. Now, here's where he says it. He says, film it. This is the guy talking. He doesn't even know the guy's filming the entire time. He screams at him, film it. You see it yourself, that they always start shooting at us, not us that start shooting at them. You know, in a combat situation, guys, it ain't easy just to blurt out a bunch of, you know, things like that. I don't think the guy staged what he said at all. I really don't. I think this is what goes on continually. And quite frankly, I do believe that if Petro Poroshenko pulled his forces back, you wouldn't see these people move anywhere. They're only wanting the area, they're only wanting self-autonomy for the area that they're, they're in right now. And of course, as we were there yesterday with the foreign ministers there of Europe, and they're talking about how to implement the Minsk agreements, that's kind of a subtle expression there of saying, well, are we ready for war with uh, Russia? Because they know that if they're going to help Ukraine take back eastern Crimea, it's going to be a war. So it's just very interesting to see that he makes that comment, film it, you see it yourself, that they always start shooting at us. And these guys, the separatists, and I'm not saying that Russia doesn't have troops in there working with these guys, but they're getting permission to fire back. They're in I've gone over the video many, many times already. Uh, they, they've had to explain in detail what's going on, who's shooting at them and stuff. Just kind of, it's very similar to that to the American military, which does kind of let me know that this isn't just a bunch of separatists fighting. Yes, there are Russian commanders, no doubt, in there. So I have to, you know, credit, credit where credit is due and, and condemnation where condemnation is due, whether it be good or bad, whichever way you want to look at it, I personally think Russia should be there helping them because if not, they would be totally annihilated as a human race in that area. The Russians would not exist if it wasn't for Russia. But that's my personal opinion on that. And right now we're looking at the news side of it. So when Putin says that he doesn't have troops there, I believe he does. And I personally believe that he has, uh, he, he may call them technically, he might be able to say technically they're not his troops because he has sent them on a mercenary mission, so to speak. And that may be the case as well. But nonetheless, this is being done professionally because it's very much like the U.S. military. In the U.S. military, you cannot engage the enemy. I mean, you do have uh, rules of engagement, you know, so... Um, ROEs, as we call it, in, or as it's called in the military there, but the point is that may change continually throughout a war and on a regular basis. But uh, otherwise, many times in the in the U.S. military, you have to you have to contact a superior to get the right to go ahead to engage the enemy when the enemy is already engaging you, uh, unless you have your ROE where you're allowed to engage them beforehand for a particular reason. Uh, anyway, though, let's move right on over, though, and another issue here, um, and that wasn't the one that I wanted next here. Let me just see real quick where I've got it at. Uh, I actually had it the entire time, and I just didn't realize I did have it. This uh, video here, this has just came out the other day. It's supposedly this was filmed on August the 30th. Uh, this is coming from a Russian town. Let me look at the name of it real quick. Novinomysk, uh, Stavropol, Russia is where this col uh, train column here 
is going along with Russian military equipment. There are tanks on there. Actually, I wrote down the number of all this was on there. I counted because it's going pretty fast. 37 tanks, 7 refueling tankers, 15 trucks. Uh, there are about 5 or 6 personnel, uh, armored personnel carriers. And uh, there's two passenger cars with military troops in those passenger cars. If you were to able to do a little bit better analyzing, you'll see that. They put in here that this was uh, the, the train was headed northeast towards Ukraine. That actually should be northwest. That is in a southern region of uh, Russia there, southwest Russia. But in uh, coordinates with uh, headed towards Ukraine, that would be more northwest, not northeast. Anyhow, I want you to actually be able to get a, a look at this. It's very amazing. The, like I said, the number of tanks, 37 tanks. Uh, this also has come out on Ukraine News, this information here. They shared this publicly. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're assuming that, yes, this is done on August the, the uh, 30th when the video really was actually captured and published but we have no way of being able to verify or authenticate that information there. Uh, I did do a satellite uh, view of the area just to try to get an idea. Uh, it does, the, 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 the train footage and the buildings that you see, the train track and stuff, does resemble that area of Russia. So yes, there is a good possibility it does. Again, as you can see, Russia is not covering up what they're sending up that way. Now, whether or not they're sending this up for the separatists or whether or not they're just beefing up that area because of their concerns of Ukraine launching an attack on the separatists and Russia having to uh, come in there and back them up or not, that I really don't know. I don't know the answer for sure which way that actually is going to be. Uh, also, another news too I thought was kind of interesting, Poland, the Baltic states silent on Russia, uh, Russia's offer to discuss security. Uh, Moscow has reached out to the Baltic states and we know that there is a lot of tensions there. Of course, one of the foreign ministers I saw him photographing myself there in Slovakia the other day. Um, but they're very much puppets of the Obama administration, so they're not responding. It says here that Poland and the three Baltic states have not yet responded to Russia's proposal to discuss European security, the Russian Deputy Defense Minister said Sunday. Uh, Anatoly and, uh, and, uh, Anton, Antonov spoke positively about cautious signals from Estonia and Lithuania that they intend to give their opinion on Moscow's invitation soon. So as we can see, Russia continually tries us to defuse the situation that NATO has really intensified uh, by having all these different troops, military drills and things of that nature being done in Latvia, Lithuania, etc. And on top of it, Poland is continually instigating the problems there uh, in their own country. This article here that came out here on September the 1st, uh, you may not be able to see that in Russian, but I, I know pretty much what it says anyway, so let me just kind of blow that up for you. This article here comes out here on September the 1st, 2016, uh, and the article, the, the title in the article here is saying that they're going to tear down uh, this is near Kalin, uh, Kaliningrad, um, Ru where Russia has their own little province there uh, on, near, on the far uh, north side of Poland. And they're going to tear down another one of the Russian monuments there that was, that was erected for, uh, as a memorial for the soldiers, some 2,000 soldiers that died in that particular area fighting during World War II. And, the, uh, of course, the mayor of the city says to Russia that we will bury the, the remains of that inside the Russian soldier cemetery. Now, this actually kicked off, though, um, so those of you that can't read Russian, I'll kind of give you a little bit more of that there to see. This issue kicked off earlier this year, around March. I did a little research on this. There were 500 identified by the Polish government monuments during the Soviet era uh, that they wanted to destroy. And Russia has always really gotten upset over this because of the fact that so many Russian soldiers died liberating the Polish from the Nazis during this time. And, but there's so much animosity t from the Polish people towards Russia. And that goes way back. That's even before World War II. 
Uh, they've always been at each other's throats, as it were. And the Polish people very much um, uh, against these, uh, these uh, statues that have been built in honor of the, of the soldiers there. Not all of them are in honor of the soldiers, mind you. This one here is, is in honor of the fallen soldiers there during World War II. And I kind of have a split thought on this. You know, one, history is history. I will say that. Secondly, I do realize that perhaps the bitter times of the Soviet Union for the Polish people is one of their justifications for wanting to bring these monuments down. But nonetheless, to me, you shouldn't bring them all down, especially in light of the fact that so many tens of thousands, millions, in fact, Jews that were killed during the Holocaust. Of course, not all in Poland, but Poland was a majority of them. Auschwitz, for example, huge number of Jews that died there. And in fact, it was the Russians that liberated the Jewish people. So, you know, if nothing else, for the sake of the Jewish people of Poland, this is a very important thing for them. You know, yes, they may not have liked one of living under communism, but you have to remember, Russia was not a communist nation before the Jesuits got involved with Vladimir Lenin, that is. Uh, actually, both jo Joseph Stalin and Vladimir Lenin were both uh, Jesuit trained, but Vladimir Lenin being the uh, one that was trained there in Geneva. Uh, and, and it was all for the purpose of bringing down Russia as a Christian nation, and it was done as an inside job by the, by the uh, Jesuits themselves in order to be able to make uh, the Roman Catholicism, the state religion, and it's exactly what it became. And I will mention, too, a very interesting thought on this as well. All the properties that these statues on are all part of the Catholic Church's property to this day now. It wasn't originally, but since the collapse of the Soviet Union, all the property later was given over to the Catholic Church. So they actually have a right and a say in this. But undoubtedly, the Catholic Church, just like it was with Pope Pius the, the 12th there, is again silent on the matter. The very people that liberated the Jews in that part of the world is that memory is being destroyed and buried with those soldiers. I think that's a travesty, without a doubt. And one other point here, and this is not just on Sputnik News, I just happened to catch it on Sputnik News, the U.S. national debt reaches record high, but no one knows how to handle it. it happens to be 19.5, or yeah, yeah, 19.5 trillion dollars, and expected to be up to 20 trillion dollars before Obama leaves office. But on the other hand, at the G20 summit, President Xi actually was there praising Russia for its own, uh, 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 how would you call it, its own economic record and stating that uh, President Xi stated that Russia was an example to the world of how to bring an economy under control. No doubt he was pointing right at Obama when he said it. I can just imagine, at least if nothing else, with his eyes or his thoughts because uh, Putin does boast of a 5.7 unemployment rate. He has actually brought down the national debt of Russia five more percent this past year. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. I read a lot of the report there. It is remarkable. But again, of course, all the people in Russia, for the most part, are poor, except for the wealthier class. They are wealthy. That does help, no doubt. Uh, but still, you know, national debt is national debt, and the U.S. could do a lot better job than what they're doing as well, but they're not. And unless someone gets in there and turns that national debt around, someone's going to get tired of funding American uh, expenditures. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, just kind of an overcap of the stories that we have seen today. Many more, of course, breaking, but that is an overcap of the ones that we've noticed. Shalom. Oh, by the way...